inhalation injury. This is a potentially life-threatening injury and I think is a little bit misunderstood. And let me try and take you through how I think about uh, thermal injury. Was this patient that we have here a candidate for potential smoke inhalation injury? Of course. There's evidence of soot and burn on the patient's face. There's already edema in the periorbital area. The nares are swollen. The entire chest is burned in edematous. This patient's at high risk for the development of smoke inhalation injury or having smoke inhalation injury. And you can see that this patient's already intubated. There are three types of injuries that occur with smoke inhalation. I'm going to talk about the one everybody thinks of most frequently first, that being thermal injury. This actually is the least common of smoke inhalation injury patients, but is the most potentially life-threatening of all of them. Thermal injury is simple transfer of heat from the ambient air into the patient's tissue. We have a very good way to dissipate heat in our nares and our oropharynx. There is a lot of redundant, very moist tissue, multiple concha that are in the nose, the nares, hairs that are in the nose, as well as the hypopharyngeal redundant tissue. As you breathe in the hot fired air, a lot of the heat is dissipated from this. If you think about if you're working in your kitchen on Thanksgiving and you're baking your turkey, uh, and you go ahead and you open the oven door and you get that blast of hot air. What's your first reaction to that hot air? Your mouth closes immediately, you take very shallow breaths and you breathe through your nares, through your nose. And this is, this is self-protecting because you're actually going to try and dissipate the heat. Once you get heat that has made it all the way through the oral pharyngeal area and is in the supraglottic area, now that heat will, has only one barrier between it and the lungs, and that are the, the, the vocal cords themselves. There's almost no or, or very limited ability to dissipate any heat in the vocal cords. And so when you get past the supraglottic area, it's a free shot for this heat to be transmitted all the way down to the mid-bronchial areas very quickly. And that's why once a patient begins to breathe this superheated air, they get a significant thermal component to their injury. If you look here in the 9-11, we had a combination of thermal injuries and we had another type of injury, and that is the particulate matter. So the second form of smoke inhalation injury, and it was actually the most common form of smoke inhalation, is that from particulate matter. And the particulate matter uh, is initially uh, filtered by your nares. You close your mouth. You don't breathe through the mouth. You breathe through your nose. Your nares begin to accumulate the large particles. You perhaps cover your mouth with your hand, cover your mouth with your shirt to try and act as a filter. <coughs> Excuse me. Once these particles get past your nose, there still is a barrier, and that again is the moist hypopharyngeal tissue. A lot of these particulate matters, are, a lot of these particles are embedded on this soft, moist tissue. But once it gets distal of that, it gets down into the airways. Soot, dust, and dirt all get down to the distal areas, and this is your typical patient who you see coughing and wheezing and spitting up carbonaceous sputum who has a smoke inhalation injury due to the uh, deposition of particulate matter in the patient's lung. The last form of smoke inhalation is that due to toxic metabolic byproducts of the combustion of, of the fire. They include carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning. Look at this patient closely. There's evidence of burns on the patient's lips there's actually burns on the cheeks with peeling of the, of the tissue. There's some edema and there's some erythema in the patient's uh, oral pharynx. And there's soot clearly in the patient's mouth. And you can see that this patient has a nasal pharyngeal uh, uh, tracheal tube that has been placed to uh, control the patient's uh, airway. What happens at the pulmonary level with all of these toxic metabolic byproducts that are exposed uh, it, are released at a fire uh, as well as the particulate matter? Well, we get very bad ventilation perfusion mismatches. We get a vasoconstriction of the uh, pulmonary smooth uh, muscle and an increase in the patient's airway resistance. So if we clinically look at these patients, they're coughing, 
If we listen to their lungs, they're wheezing, and they're probably desaturating. So how do we combat this? We combat this by high flow oxygen therapy for twofold reasons. Number one, they're hypoxemic in many cases. But more importantly, until you get your carbon monoxide level back, they may have had a significant exposure to carbon monoxide if this is a close space fire injury. So we put them in a 100% non-rebreathing face mask we leave them on there until we get back our carbon monoxide levels. If they're even minimally elevated, we usually keep them as a matter of protocol here at UCSD on the high flow oxygen for at least four hours. If patients have carbon monoxide levels that are elevated, greater than 20, we actually take them to the hyperbaric uh, chamber at our institution. Another important thing that occurs over time with a bad smoke inhalation injury is we have a pulmonary edema, secondary atelectasis, and an impaired bronchociliary function. With that, we're unable to clear both the uh, particulate matter as well as to clear our bacterial load. And secondary bacterial infection resulting in pneumonia is not an uncommon occurrence, even in patients with very small burns to the face. That group of patient is your elderly patient who has chronic obstructive lung disease, who is on home oxygen, who lights up a cigarette, and with the oxygen being present has a flash burn to the periorbital and perinasal area. Usually it's less than 1% total body surface area. It tends to be a partial thickness burn. It heals quickly. The complication of your patient, though, is that they develop a secondary pneumonia and get sick from that. So clinical signs that might make you think of an inhalation injury, once again, there's an index of suspicion that is elevated because the patient is in a closed space area. You see evidence of facial, pharyngeal, edema, burn, carbonaceous sputum on the mouth or in the nose or nares, or a patient who just has the inability to protect their, their, their airway. They may have a secondary inhalation injury resulting in hypoxemia and need airway control. These are some pictures from our bronchoscopy team of significant airway diseases here. What you can see in the central picture is marked erythema and edema of the mid-bronchial region. We see on both the left and the right pictures here a lot of um, uh, tissue uh, loss and tissue debris and secondary secretions. So you can see how this rapidly can go ahead and occlude the patient's distal airways. Simple nasal tracheal suctioning does not seem to be as effective as uh, endobronchial suctioning with a bronchoscope in this patient. We've been able to demonstrate in our patients a very decreased rate of mortality with significant smoke inhalation by what we think is a very aggressive protocol of pulmonary toilet, which includes daily bronchoscopies in, in, in these uh, patients. Once again, things that we want to look about or think about with the potential for an inhalation injury was, is this a closed space uh, fire? What was the type of material that was burned in the fire? What is the potential of a toxic inhalant that the patient may have been exposed to? What is the duration of exposure? And is there evidence of intoxication already in these, in these uh, patients? The most common is carbon monoxide. A secondary toxic byproduct is that of cyanide. Every year in the United States, about 10,000 patients are affected by a significant carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. And typical rates uh, of 30% uh, uh, are seen in patients who have been in a very significant closed space uh, injury with evidence of alterations of their CNS. And carbon monoxide poisoning affects you in two very adverse effects. One, in your ability to oxygenate because the carbon monoxide is displacing oxygen off the hemoglobin. But secondarily, carbon monoxide is becoming um, uh, deposited in the central nervous system. And it's at the central nervous system uh, uh, level that we see secondary lifelong, potentially lifelong effects of carbon monoxide, or which results in decreased sensorium, decreased mentation, alteration in motor and sensory function. And this is a problem that can occur at relatively lower levels of carbon monoxide poisoning, as low as uh, 20%. If we think about carbon monoxide, 
carbon monoxide has an affinity to bind with hemoglobin that is 200 times stronger than the ability of oxygen to bind with hemoglobin. And thus, it very easily uh, binds with our, our hemoglobin. It shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to, to, to the left. It, we deliver less oxygen at the cellular level, and we end up going into an anaerobic metabolism. Remember the disparity that you'll see between your measured uh, levels of uh, arterial oxygenation as compared to your oxygen saturation. This is a problem that if a patient has high carbon monoxide levels, because our O2 SAT monitor can't discriminate between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin, it will still measure adequate levels of O2 SATs, perhaps 95% or 100%. Yet the patient may have a significant deficit at their arterial level of oxygenation. So if you have a patient and you suspect a, a closed space injury, potential smoke inhalation with carbon monoxide, you need to go ahead and get the uh, O2 saturations as well as your PaO2 from your ABG. The half-life of carbon monoxide at room air is uh, almost uh, 320 minutes. If you go ahead and place the patient simply on 100% face mask, you can decrease this to about an hour and a half, 80 to 90 minutes. If you pace it, place your patient in a diving chamber, you can really decrease the, the rate of uh, carbon monoxide elimination uh, significantly. The problem with this, and we have experience with it at our institution, is even though we have a diving chamber, if your patient comes in in the middle of the night, you go ahead and you recognize that they have a significant uh, risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. You place them on high flow. Perhaps they're very ill and they're on the ventilator. By the time you bring the people in to begin your hyperbaric dive, you very often can drive your carbon monoxide levels to levels that are less than 10%. The reason why we go ahead and dive this is there's evidence that the patient's long-term CNS sequelae from these elevated carbon monoxide levels may be decreased if we go ahead and continue to drive this carbon monoxide out of the CNS. And this is not adequately measured on a real-time basis on your blood gas. And that's the reason why we go ahead and do that. The data is, 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 is suggestive, uh, but is not as uh, compelling as perhaps we would like to see it. But being a regional center, having the ability to do this, and having reasonable data, we think this is a reasonable course for our patients. So if we think of our patients who have carbon monoxide poisoning, what effects might we, might we see in them? If we look here at this table, patients who have simple 10% levels of carbon monoxide poisoning are relatively asymptomatic and may only complain of headache. As we move down or move up the percentage of carbon monoxide that's found in hemoglobin, at 30%, we actually begin to see some visual disturbances that have been predated or preceded by some dizziness and nausea. By the time we get to 40 and 50%, we see alterations in the patient's neurologic status and mental status. And by the time we hit 50 to 60%, we see evidence of seizures, coma, or cardiac dysfunction. Important point here is that the LD50 of carbon monoxide poisoning does not go of that high. We begin to see people die at levels of 40, 50, and by 60%, we're losing most of the patients. So even though we think of 100% as the scale here, our really functional working scale is less than 50% in our patients, so we need to be cognizant. So as I mentioned earlier, get 100% face mask on these patients, intubate these patients if indicated to protect their airway, or if they have a significant carbon monoxide, intubate them so you actually can deliver 100% FiO2 to these patients. Remember, even though we put them on 100% face mask, there's no way we're actually delivering 100% to these patients by face mask. So get them intubated and get them supported. Let me conclude this lecture by just talking about escherotomies and fasciotomies. Escherotomies are required in burn surgery when we have evidence of circumferential burns, partial or full thickness burns on an extremity or a digit that seems to be impairing the ability of the patient to perfuse this organ. It's usually an increase in pressure 
at the skin level that's resulting in an increased pressure within the extremity. This increased pressure within the tissues of the extremity results in decreased venous return. So although you're able to pump blood into the extremity, you get poor venous return and you develop secondary ischemia. If we look here, this is a patient who has a full thickness burn over his entire anterior chest wall, goes up onto his neck. What's going to happen with this patient with this? And remember, this doesn't have to be a circumferential uh, problem on a chest, but what we're going to see is as we begin to resuscitate our patient, the patient's going to get third spacing of their fluid. Because the skin is tight all over the anterior torso, we don't have the ability of the skin to expand anymore. And sooner rather than later, the patient's going to have decreased compliance of their anterior chest wall. When that happens, they become more difficult to ventilate. What you'll see is increase in your peak airway pressures, increase in your mean airway pressures, your, your alarms on your ventilator will begin to buzz because you will begin to see decreased volumes that are getting into the patient. What we need to do in that case is simply make our escharotomies, which are incisions that go through the epidermis and dermis and extend into the fat tissue, but do not extend into the fascia of the muscle below. Repeating, it does not extend into the fascia of the muscle below because the constricting band here is actually the skin, the epidermis and the dermis. Now we would continue this uh, incision down onto the abdomen and come across the abdomen so we would create, if you will, two separate movable plates, an anterior chest plate and a lower abdominal plate. So the patient's movement, which normally occurs with inspiration and expiration on the ventilator, would be facilitated. Additionally, because this patient is burned on the shoulders and up onto the neck, we would carry this up in a symmetric fashion, the incision onto the neck and across the neck and down to the contralateral side so we wouldn't have a constricting neck type lesion which would constrict the blood flow coming down through the jugular veins. Here are simple escherotomies on the extremities. We have a medial escherotomy and we have a lateral escherotomy. One thing that you can not have to be too concerned about in full thickness burns when you're doing these escherotomies is what's the cosmetic effect of this because the burn tissue is going to be removed anyway. That's in contradistinction to fasciotomies where you're going through normal tissue and you're excising the fascia, making incisions into the fascia, for which it's very important to be concerned about the cosmetic as well as the functional ramifications of where you put your fasciotomy incisions. So here on this patient to the left, you see the escherotomy sites on the arm, medial here, lateral. You see them on the chest on the neck, across the chest, across the abdomen, and down onto the legs. You carry them onto the fingers, on both aspects of the fingers, remembering that you have your digital artery and nerve on both sides. If you follow the creases at the margins of your creases, you should be relatively safe in making your incisions through here on both sides of all five fingers. And as you can see here, the dorsum of the hand here also has evidence of escherotomies, and the lower end of the leg has the escherotomy, which is then carried on to the dorsum of the foot. Most of the times, you are not required to do escherotomies on the palmar surface of the hand or on the plantar aspect of the foot because the skin is so thick here that it's very often that you, if you release the dorsum of the hand and the dorsum of the foot, that you're able to reestablish perfusion. There will be instances where that will not be the case, but those will be in the minority. So I'd like to thank you for sitting through this rather lengthy discussion about the initial management uh, of uh, burns. It's our hope that by sitting and thinking about this, that you'll be able to approach the burns in a very systematic way to reestablish a perfusion, reestablish adequate oxygenation, and begin the initial care of burns with the local um, topical uh, uh, agents, uh, and to think about whether or not these patients have injuries that are going to require ultimate surgery. We would encourage you to transfer your patients uh, 
to the local burn center or regional burn center if they meet the American Burn Association criteria or if you have any concerns about the burned patient, please call us or refer the patients to us. Major requirements for sending patients to an ABA center are the very young and the very old who are burned, burns which are greater than 10%, burns that cross joints, burns that affect the face. There's a lot of patients who uh, can really uh, have improved outcomes by the care they get at a specialized burn center. So on behalf of the UCSD staff, I'd like to thank you again and wish you luck.